It got me thinking, and just, is the Steam Deck worth the wait? How long is the Steam Deck actually going to be a viable product? Are there any competitors that are out on the market? And heck, as we're waiting into quarter three, quarter four, maybe even into 2023, will some of these competitors even have products that are going to surpass the Steam Deck? And you guys thought I was crazy. Hey guys, Turk here. Hope you're having a good one. We've talked about handhelds here on the channel a whole bunch of times, and we've even journeyed into the beyond trying to give you guys a sneak peek to the type of performance we're going to see from the next generation of handheld. As impressive as the Steam Deck's performance has been up to this point, I told you guys it was going to be about a year to two years before we start to see some really honest competition hitting the mark. And judging by a lot of the videos we've seen and a lot of the news that's hitting, man, that competition is coming a lot sooner than we anticipated, or at least you guys have anticipated. So in today's video, we're going to be talking about all the different companies that have next generation handheld devices that are hitting the market within the next six to 12 months and give you guys kind of a feel for the different specs, features, ergonomics, as well as my recommendations to consoles that y'all might want to pre-order or at least keep your eyes on to see if any other information comes about. Now, before we get to the products, I want to talk briefly about what I classify as a next generation handheld, because there's still a lot of products that are up for pre-order right now and a lot of older designs that are currently sold at a little bit better of a price and even stuff that's about to hit the market. So in my eyes, when it comes to next generation, I'm definitely looking for updated ergonomics as well as upgraded and more refined bells and whistles, especially when it comes to learning from lessons learned from older designs. And special thanks to Valve and the Steam Deck's success, a lot of these companies are having to re-kind of engineer their equation when it comes to their price points in order to get things down to a more competitive level, especially in our current economic climate. Now guys, you know me, I love computer hardware, and that's definitely where I'm going to be putting a lot of my emphasis in today's video. So we're going to be putting aside all of the old Tiger Lake and Vega-based APUs from the older generation in favor of the new Alder Lake and Intel Z APUs, and you guys know it, the Ryzen 6000 CPUs are here, and we have been loving those for the past few videos here on the channel. So of course, updated CPUs and GPUs, but as we start to integrate newer CPUs and GPUs and all that stuff, there's been a lot of more innovation when it comes to joysticks, Wi-Fi cards, as well as other types of technology that are getting bundled into these newer designs. Now, I'm not gonna be focusing on those specific, but I will be scrolling some of those images across as we talk about the products. So without further ado, let's talk about AIM. AIN is a newcomer in the x86 handheld market coming hot off the heels of the well-received AIN Odin. It's an ARM-based CPU handheld device that's been favoring more of a low-cost option going with a smaller form factor. Now, when it comes to next-generation handhelds, AIN is going with their Loki lineup, which is actually impressive. They've got options all the way from the low-power, low-budget, all the way to the top-tier spec while still maintaining that smaller form factor that would be very beneficial for a handheld device. The Loki Mini is the lowest powered offering from AIN and it's featuring the Celeron 7305 or the Mendocino processor coming at 239 and 260 respectively. Now, Mendocino is a name you're gonna hear a lot throughout this video, but we'll talk a little bit more about that specific later in the video. Now these processors are turned way down, especially that Celeron. It's only got a clock speed of 1.1 gigahertz, which is not powerful enough for a lot of the more modern emulators as well as AAA games that we like to test. And let's not forget to mention that the battery capacity is very limited, right around 20 watt hours. Now for the Intel parts, they are gonna be using the last generation of memory standard with LPDDR4X running at 4266, but the AMD does favor the latest generations with LPDDR5. If you are looking for a little bit more horsepower in your Loki Mini, go with the Loki Mini Pro, packing a Pentium 8505 or once again, the Mendocino processor from AMD. Now here on this chart, we've got a lot of asterisks and that's putting things into speculation. And when it comes to Mendocino, there has been some rumors going around that it is gonna be only using two compute units, which when we compare to the 6600U or the 6800U, that's just not a lot of horsepower in the graphics department but hopefully the Zen 2 cores boost up to a high enough frequency that make this still a pretty good offering. 
The Intel processor in the Loki Mini Pro finally gets some modern boosts with the performance cores boosting up to 4.4 GHz and the efficiency cores going up to 3.3 GHz. Again, Mendocino, we just haven't gotten a lot of information about it. Hopefully we'll get some clarity on that in due time. Along with the boosted CPU performance, the battery size is also getting a sizable boost of about 53%. Though it does maintain the same screen size as the Loki Mini, we get only get a minor price increase, and this should be a great budget emulation machine. The Pentium version comes at $279, though with the Mendocino offering, you are only really getting a battery improvement when that might not justify the $39 increase. With the Lokis, there's three different variants coming at 489, 579, and 649. With the lower priced option going with 8 gigabytes of LPDDR5, and the 579 and 649 go with 16 gigabytes, though having different storage configurations. Though the 6600U is a lot better equipped than the Mendocino offerings that we saw previously, I don't know if it's going to have enough horsepower to drive the 1080p panels that we've been seeing in these other different products. But with any luck, FSR should be able to bump us up just a bit. At the top of the stack is going to be the Loki Max, and they're using the top tier thin and light processor from AMD with the 6800U. This is going to be utilizing Zen 3 Plus cores, clocking in at 4.7 GHz on the boost clock speed with 8 cores and 16 threads. As for the integrated GPU, again, we're going to be using those RDNA 2 graphics cores, and we're going to have 12 compute units boosting up to 2.2 GHz. Along with the bump in the processor speed, we're getting an additional 6 watt hours in battery life, which makes it very comparable to a lot of the top tier products that are out today. Overall, I think there's a lot of positive things to say about AIN across their entire portfolio. The biggest advantage, in my opinion, is the consistent form factor. By simplifying production costs and keeping the consistent 6-inch 1080p panel, it's going to be pretty easy to differentiate between the different options that you would want to pick up. Along with that, there's a great product separation across their portfolio, going all the way down to their low-cost, lower power options, their mid-range, medium performance options, and their Loki Max hopefully being very comparable to the other top-tier products. And let's not forget, we're getting very aggressive pricing across the entire spectrum, which puts AIN at a good standpoint when it comes to people wanting a good mobile product. However, there's a few things from AIN that are kind of keeping me a little bit on guard. They have seen a less than stellar track record when it comes to their delivery of their current AN Odin products. I've been doing a lot of testing with my One X Mini. The 7 inch screen looks really good, even if it is at a higher resolution. And I think with a 6 inch screen, I think it's going to be just a little bit too small for a 1080p native output. And last of all, and it'll be consistent with other products as well, it's just not clear on how well Mendocino is going to perform. And I really don't think that's going to justify the pre-order right now until we get some performance numbers from AIN. Next up is going to be the a and Neo, and they are no stranger in the handheld market. They've had a lot of good products that have come out, and they've developed quite a cult following when it comes to both influencers as well as the community at large. They've been heavily featured with LTT, GN, Fox, and with ETA Prime, so this brand has recognition to spare going into their next generation of products. Unfortunately, the A and Neo Next did get overshadowed with the success of the Valve Steam Deck back this January and February, and their current A and Neo era is only just starting to hit the pre-orders. So they're in a little bit of a rough spot when it comes to, you know, their product delivery, but they have committed to start delivering their products coming this November. At the top of the stack is the aptly named A and Neo 2. A and Neo is not cutting any quarters with their latest flagship along with a top-of-the-line processor, top-tier memory, and options for storage and monitor resolution, a &Neo is turning the crank with their form factor. The next a &Neo with the a &Neo 2 is a lot more organic with round, elegant corners. While it's still using a 7-inch screen, the sizable molded grips enable the unit to be thick enough while maintaining a thin appearance. Beyond that though, the extra trimmings are enhanced beyond their other models, such as the S3 fingerprint, Wi-Fi 6E, dual gyroscopes, and other yet-to-be-announced features. Where the a and &E 2 flaunts the company's abilities, the a and &E Geek cuts some of the corners in order to make this top-tier device more competitive. While maintaining effectively the same high-level components such as the 6800U, 16 gigs of LPDDR5, 
they are trying to cut some quarters in order to limit some cost. Now, this is current speculation, but there's potential for a smaller battery to be put into the Geek units compared to the a &E's previous 47 watt hour battery in their top tier units. Also, LPDDR5 is expected to be equipped with most of these Ryzen processors, but just like with the Steam Deck, slower RAM could make its way into this model, though I think it is pretty unlikely. Now, the good news with the A&EO Geek is that both of these models are going to be far more competitive in the pricing standpoint when compared to other A&EO products. Now, if you weren't shooting for the best iGPU performance, just like the Loki, we get the 6600U and that could be a lucrative option, though on paper it should perform slightly worse than the Steam Deck. Now, the Geek 2 has been the most confident when it comes to the spec sheets, and we do see an expected shipping date at the end of November. So anyone that's stuck in the queue for the Steam Deck to after quarter three, man, they might want to think twice and hop in on the Geek. Editor Turk here, and over the past 24 hours, a &EO held yet another press conference where they announced another product to their lineup with the a &EO Next 2. Now, this is going to be a departure from their current a &EO Next, and it's going to be favoring the ergonomics that we've seen with the Geek as well as the a &EO 2. But what's more shocking is the technology that's built into the device. Now, a &EO claims that it's going to be enabling a discrete graphics card, but there is a little bit of confusion on if it's going to be a dedicated GPU built into the device or if they're going to be enabling external GPU support. And since this news conference happened just over the past 24 hours, I really recommend you guys check out the a &EO Discord. I got a link down in the description. That way you can get a little bit more clarity and talk with a lot of us nerds in real time about this latest development. Now, if you're wanting to look at an Intel-based a &EO device for the first time, you're going to be able to get an Alder Lake-based CPU, and what I like to see here is we've got an Intel-based dedicated GPU coming from their DG2 lineup. Now, we're still getting early reports of what that type of GPU is going to perform like, but it's a promising step and a huge leap when it comes to handheld designs. If you're wanting to go with an AMD-based design, of course, you're going to get a Ryzen 6000 series CPU. But what I find shocking is they're including a dedicated 6000 series mobile GPU. I've looked at the 6700M in my thin and light laptop, and I'm just shocked that they're going to try and smush this much power consumption into a handheld device. Now, there's a lot of different renders that we're seeing. We're seeing some interesting additions to the bottom right of the unit, and we're seeing the addition of a kickstand. So if you guys want to know more about this particular design, make sure you hit the bell icon and let me know down in the comments if you want me to take a closer look at this press release. Now, if you're interested in any other types of formats coming from a &EO, maybe you'd be interested in either the slide or the flip. The slide will utilize a 6-inch 1080p screen that slides up to reveal a full physical QWERTY keyboard, much to the chagrin of many people entering passwords and actually using their handheld for computing. Now, if the old Nokia style isn't appealing for you, maybe the laptop-like clamshell design from the Flip will be more appealing. However, each of these designs has little to no information available for it, so these are probably more concepts than deliverable products at this point. a &EO is currently pre-ordering their current generation of Air products, but the Plus has been announced, and this is where I think this product line gets much more interesting. Sporting lower price points and similar screens, we've got some really good combinations. For Intel processors, there's two different variants, the Pentium 8505 as well as the i3-1215. Both of these units are going to be using Alder Lake-based CPU cores, and that is known for a great boost clock speed with some good efficiency cores. The Pentium 8505 is a good balance between the CPU and the GPU performance. Now, given the similar price point as the Loki Minis, I think that this model will have the same capacity and utilize the latest LPDDR4X for memory, but that has yet to be announced by a &EO. And the same goes for the i3-1215, though it does get an additional performance core and we get a 50% increase in GPU execution units, only for a small bump in price of $50. And as we said with the Loki Mini Pro, when we got this Mendocino option from a &EO, we still don't know the clock speeds for the CPU or the GPU, but we have seen those leaks that confirm that we'll have access to only two compute units. But at these price points, we're undercutting the currently pre-ordered a &EOs, and we'll be seeing these somewhere in early 23. 
With these next generation A and Neo devices, we are migrating away from those angled corners and we're going for a more natural and organic feel across their entire lineup. And with their Air Plus lineup, these price points are getting really intriguing. However, A and Neo's high-end cost is very suspicious. And what I don't like to see at this point in the game from A and Neo is there's just so much churn when it comes to the specifications. And let's not forget that A and Neo is focused in China. And if you're going to be ordering this from the US, Indiegogo is just less than an ideal platform for going to pre-order and purchase a device. And man, waiting all the way up until late November and into 2023, I think these products are going to be missing that initial wave of hype that's coming with the next generation handhelds. The third company we're talking about today is GPD. And just like with A and Neo, as well as One X, GPD has been around the block for quite some time and they have gotten a lot of different designs under their belt. And with the broad success of the Win 3 as well as the Win Max, it makes a lot of sense for GPD to just refine and rehash their current designs with better ergonomics and more recent parts of hardware in order to make the Win Max 2. Just as our other flagships, the Win Max 2 equips the latest portable parts with the flair for a larger form factor. The Intel variant utilizes the i7-1260P with double the P and E cores of the Air Plus, packing in 50% more GPU horsepower, and it's even running faster clocks to boot. Its battery capacity is also increased in order to accommodate the programmable 20 to 28 watt target TDP for the Intel processor. This version uses the modest LPDDR5 5200 RAM, though it can come equipped with 32 gigabytes of overall capacity compared to all of the competition today. The AMD version sports the 6800U and aims to mirror the top tier specs from across the board. With all of this extra space, GPD equips a 10.1 inch 1600p monitor with a 16 by 10 aspect ratio, though it does recommend running that monitor at 1200p. And since this is essentially a 10.1 inch laptop, there's a whole list of other bells and whistles that are included, like options for 4G LTE, additional NVMe storage, upgraded sticks and keyboard compared to their older Win Max, this newer version just enhances everything across the board from its older design. So for me, this looks like a really good product lineup, especially considering the larger screen size as well as the larger battery capacity for both different variants. With that larger form factor, we get a more effective cooling solution and we can increase our TDP ranges, which products up to this point haven't really advertised that they want to do. And given that it's effectively a smaller form factor laptop, there's a lot of non-gaming use cases that the GPD WinMax 2 can be really good at. However, this form factor, as much as I want to hype it up, it's not exactly gamer friendly. We see really good handheld controls on some of these other handhelds, and this is kind of just a laptop, so it might not feel natural to most gamers. And let's not forget to mention, we still don't know what the price this is going to be, and we don't even know a ship date for the final production units. However, they're currently going through their beta program, and people like the Fox and several people on the GPD Discord have gotten access to their beta units. So I'm hoping in the next month or two, we'll get updated dates, prices, and config options, and hopefully get to see these maybe in October of this year, and maybe with any luck, September. Now, the main reason that this video has taken so long to come out is I was hoping to see something from One X coming across my news feeds, and I just haven't seen anything. But we have seen a new addition to the lineup, and that is from AOKZ, I think is what the how they say their name. They have an 8-inch model that's being released, and it looks really compelling. Despite the name being really confusing, the AOKZ is a sudden introduction into the mix, and it has a rapid delivery window. What's more impressive when we look at this spec sheet is it's going to be utilizing LPDDR5X, and it aims to increase data rates even further, but interestingly, this product is still clocking in at 6400. Now, similar to some of the One X units that I've tested in the past, this is going to be using a larger screen than the competition. So the form factor is very reminiscent of the 8.4 inch One X player I've reviewed in the channel. However, where I said that the One X really needed to improve upon their design, the AOKZ improves their grips and implements rounded edges across the corner, a welcome enhancement that I mentioned in my Steam Deck versus One X player review. Though most of the spec for this device is very clear, 
We still haven't received official storage capacity information, though I think it will be between either 512 gigabytes or the one terabyte standard. Now, I have had some conversations with One X and their relationship with AOKZ, and they can confirm that they're not directly related with the company, though they will be helping them out with some of the production of these newer units. And to me, that seems like a positive win for AOKZ, especially considering the high quality standards that I've seen from both my One X Mini as well as my One X player. And if you're curious on just how well their unit's going to perform, they've been very transparent and have uploaded videos to YouTube showing gameplay of both Forza Horizon 5, Elden Ring, at a couple of different TDP ranges. So I think that's a pretty good starting point when it comes to PR. And guys, I, the one thing that shocks me the most is they're expecting to ship these things in September of 2022. Now, I don't know the quantities of units that are, they're going to be shipping, but I imagine with this short of a launch window, pre-orders are going to be right around the corner. Now, unfortunately, is the price. The One X Mini comes in at about $1,200, and the One X Player is a little bit more expensive. So I would imagine this is going to be a premium product, but I hope they're aggressively pricing it around $800 to $900. I think that would be a sweet spot and would be really fitting for a higher-end device. And since this is such a new development and the launch window is so soon, I imagine we're going to be getting a whole bunch more information in a, such a rapid time frame. So guys, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and following me over on Twitter. That way you can get the latest news from these new devices. With just about 17 different offerings that are coming to the table in the next six months to a year, I got three different recommendations that I think y'all should do a little more research and try and see if that's something that's worth picking up or putting on pre-order. If you're looking for an emulator that is both low cost and has good emulation performance, I highly recommend looking at the Loki Mini Pro. It's going to be using an Alder Lake based CPU with the Pentium 8505 and its CPU cores boost up to 4.4 gigahertz, which I think is a great thing for emulation. Now it's not graphically endowed like some of the RDNA 2 options, but with the UHD graphics and 48 execution units, I think it'll be serviceable for most emulation tasks. Though it is lower spec on the memory interface as well as capacity and storage, I think having the removable SD card and the smaller form factor right at 6 inches on the screen, $279 is a great option, especially considering it's being shipped in the quarter 4 of 22. If you're looking for a AAA capable handheld, you've got to go with the AOKZ rocking the Ryzen 7 6800U. It's going to be able to run at 15 watts, and they've shown data showing it running at 28 watts. That way you can get the full boost clock of the RDNA 2 iGPU, and you'll also get 4.7 gigahertz out of all of the Zen 3 Plus cores. It's going to be using the even more recent LPDDR5X running at 6400 on the data rate, and it's going to be utilizing a larger 8-inch screen with a 1200p resolution, but what I find more important is that it's shipping starting in September of 22. And if the price isn't totally outrageous, I definitely could see this swaying a bunch of potential Steam Deck owners. If you're wanting to be a little bit more budget conscious with a AAA machine or a higher end emulating machine, you can't go wrong with either the Loki Max or the a &Eo Geek 2. Both are going to be using the 6800U, utilizing most of the boost clock speeds of that processor, the battery size might sway you one way or the other once we learn a little bit more information, and I think really the defining factor there is going to be the form factor. Would you prefer the 6-inch screen from the Loki Max, or would you rather have the 7-inch screen, kind of like our 1X Player Mini here, coming from the Geek 2? Now, unfortunately, we don't know the ship date for the Loki Max, and we are expecting the Geek 2 to ship towards the end of November. So right around that Christmas time frame might be a good time. So definitely keep your eyes peeled for pre-order dates for either of those two options. They'd be a great fit and definitely worth the money. And if you are wanting to talk more next generation, we're talking, you know, Steam Deck 2 or going into other handheld devices, I would definitely keep my ear to the ground listening for the Ryzen Phoenix APU. It's going to be using Zen 4 CPU cores and RDNA 3 graphics, which promises to get about 50% performance per watt improvement from RDNA 2. So definitely hit subscribe if you're wanting to hear more information about that. 
But guys, that's what I think about the next generation of handhelds. Let me know what you think down in the comments and help me get my subscriber numbers up so that these companies can send me one of these for review. But again, thank you guys for watching the video and sticking to the end. Turk Force, we'll catch you in the next one.